Thanks, Ron. If you'll just excuse me for a second, um, I've got a roadmap due actually, and I just need to finish this off. So just just a second. Um, social sign up, yeah, we'll, we'll give that a four for value, and it's probably a five for cost. Um, Google Plus. Does anyone still use Google Plus? Is that still a thing? Uh, Google Plus integration, we'll give that a one for value. Um, it's probably a lot of work. Um, the referral program, uh, we'll say is an eight, and uh, it's probably uh, a two for cost. I, I think I'm done. There's my uh, roadmap for uh, next quarter all sorted. Ah, I know, I'll, uh, I'll put it in a chart. We've seen lots of charts the last couple of days. It always makes you look smarter in front of other people. Uh, and it'll make it easier to make roadmap decisions. So I'm just going to plot here value on one axis, cost on the other. And let's plot out all the features. And oh, that's pretty obvious. We need, probably should do the referral program first. Uh, and then the iPhone app. And we'll, I don't think we'll ever get, we'll put the Google Plus integration in the someday bucket. Um, and uh, I think we're done. Roadmaps, it's, it's pretty easy, isn't it, creating a roadmap? Um, and there are dozens of these prioritization frameworks out there. Um, if, you're, if you're new to the product management discipline or you've been in product management for a while, when you look up things or materials on how to create a roadmap, basically you end up with some sort of a prioritization framework where you give features a set of scores. If it's a really advanced framework, it's multiple scores, and you've got to do some divisions and subtractions. Um, if it's a basic framework, you add a couple of numbers together, and, uh, and you're done. Decision making is super easy. I'm not sure if I prescribe to that world that road mapping is, is, is a science. Um, what I hope to share with you today is um, maybe just a different perspective on how to build a road map. Uh, and I'd like to propose road mapping is much more of a messy process. Uh, I think it's much more of an art than is in the science. Now, those prioritization frameworks are super, super valuable, um, but I think that's the only thing we talk about as a discipline when we talk about how do we actually make decisions on how to prioritize a roadmap. Uh, as Roger said, I'm Sharif Manso. I'm a product uh, manager at Atlassian. I've been there for about uh, seven years. Um, and so this talk primarily is just a bunch of um, tips and techniques that we've tried uh, and trialed at Atlassian and made a lot of mistakes through a lot of stuff. And what I'm sharing with you is, is the things that have stuck uh, with us uh, for building roadmaps. So to talk you through about uh, road mapping being much more of an art than it is a science, um, there are two things we'll cover today. Uh, the first thing I want to spend a bit of time, and I can't talk about roadmaps without talking about the importance of understanding the inputs into which you create your roadmap. So I'll spend a little bit of time on that. And the next thing I'll talk about is three different ways you may want to prioritize your backlog. Just three ways, and you may mix and match them. You may use dozens of other ways. You may use one of those prioritization frameworks that exist out there. But I just want to pick three different ways of thinking about how to build your roadmap backlog. Uh, but to start off, a, a little story. My um, wife and I just moved house at the start of uh, this year. And uh, my wife loves reading books, physical books. She will, I cannot convince her for the life of me to buy a Kindle. Um, and so from our old house, we had in storage boxes of books, which just moved to the new house. And there are still boxes of books. And she wanted to buy some bookshelves so that she can put them up, even though she probably only reads one every few months. But um, it's another story. It's a sensitive topic in the, in the family. But um, so we decided to go to IKEA, as you do. First mistake, go to IKEA. Uh, go to IKEA, go for a long drive, get there. Uh, and we bought this most basic 101 sort of bookshelf. Um, but the problem with IKEA is you know, you have to go through like the the tourist drive of Ikea before you kind of get to that thing that you want. And then you walk out with like a hot dog and an ice cream and you feel totally sick afterwards and you regret uh, even doing that a few hours later. Come home, super frustrated, but we've got the most basic bookshelf in the world. My wife's like, are you good to do this for this afternoon and, and uh, just build a bookshelf and I'll, I'll come back later. I'm like, yeah, not a problem. One-on-one -on -one bookshelf, this can't be that hard. I'm in software for a particular reason, but let's see how we go. I open up the box, I throw all the stuff out on the carpet didn't really look at any of the material, not even the instructions. Can't be that hard, really. Um, it's the sides and some shelves, right? So I put the sides up, get the backing board, and I put the backing board around the sides. And there's like a gazillion nails. It's about like 30 to 50 nails. You, I see a few head nods. You must have put one of these together. Um, you put a, a boatload of nails around the back of this bookshelf. And I'm like, I'm almost done. So I lift the bookshelf up. All that's left is to slide in the shelves. and. Um, I realize the slots for the shelves are on the outside of the sides. I'm like terribly embarrassed right now. Like this cannot be that hard. My wife, like within a few minutes, pokes her head down the stairs and is like, 
you didn't read the instructions, did you? <laughs> Complete guilt on my face. But I, I, I totally failed to survey what was in the box. Pour all the stuff out. Have a look. Read the, look at the tools. Look at the pieces. Look at the instructions. Before I went ahead and made a decision about how I was going to go constructing this simple, simple bookshelf. I'll, st I'll stay in the software business. So I want to propose to you today and think about roadmaps as really a set of decisions. Thinking about roadmaps as a set of decisions. And if, if we think about roadmaps that way, then arguably to build a comprehensive and a solid roadmap, then the, probably the most important thing we can do, or we should be doing, is understanding our inputs before we go ahead and make a decision. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about just some of the inputs you should be considering when you're building a roadmap, because this is from the basis on how you should go about uh, building your roadmap. The first input is an obvious one, but I think one that's very easy to forget, especially the larger your organization gets, is that your roadmap should be a reflection of your company goals. Um, our friends at Intercom uh, use the expression, I'm paraphrasing here, something along the lines of, um, you should be able to pick up any item on a roadmap and actually work out how that, and, and almost guess or estimate or predict what the company goal or what the direction uh, sort of is. And at last scene, we have this framework that we've created called the vision, VTFM framework, Vision, Themes, Focus Areas, and Metrics. Um, this is a framework uh, that we created. We modeled it off a, a Salesforce uh, framework. Um, but it's pretty simple. Uh, we have a document that everyone in the company is aware of, where we have our company-wide vision. Uh, what are the themes that will help us uh, get there? Uh, what are our different focus areas? And how will we measure and know that we're successful and who's accountable uh, for each of those uh, measures? Um, so this is called uh, our VTFM document, and everyone in the company uh, is aware, and, is, and when you're new to the company, you on board and you have to read this document and be aware of it. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the VTFM framework is modeled off a uh, Salesforce framework. Um, you could look it up in the book behind the cloud. It's not called VTFM in the, in the book, but um, it, it's a V2MOM or something like that. Uh, we've changed it a little bit to suit some of our processes. But the idea here is pretty simple. Uh, you have the company-wide sort of vision and goals. Uh, you have products which they probably have. We use the OKR framework. Um, if you haven't used that, you can just Google that. Objectives and key results, that's what it stands for. Our products have a set of OKRs, things that are supposed to hit, goals they're supposed to meet, and how will we know when they've reached those goals. And then we have our product roadmaps uh, there that form on, under uh, each of our products. And the idea here is pretty simple, but incredibly challenging to do the bigger you get as an organization, which is you should be able to trace every one of these bars that you draw on your roadmaps or whatever it is that you draw all the way back to the company goals. And if you can't, maybe you should be having a serious conversation with your team about why are we doing this? Is it really that important? Um, why is it on the roadmap? Should we keep doing it or should we, should we stop doing it? So that's the first input. Now, the second input, um, super, super critical uh, for you out there, is your product vision. And your vision is really your take on what the future looks like when you've solved the problems that you wanted to solve uh, out there and how the world will be a much better place uh, when you get there. And why this is a super important for uh, building a roadmap is that without a vision, you'll continue to flip-flop between what actually goes into your product and what's not. A vision is a critical piece in helping you decide what's in your roadmap. And we've heard several times uh, over the last couple of days um, that arguably the role of a product manager or whoever's uh, performing that function um, is to decide what not to do. And you need to have a set of criteria about how you're going to decide what not to do. And if your vision's not super clear, uh, then you'll be putting a whole bunch of stuff in there that may not be in your uh, general direction. And the biggest corporate of these things is to choose for a better a phrase, a customer satisfaction sort of feature requests. Now, customer feature requests are not necessarily a bad thing. They're probably good, lots of good ideas, whatever. But you need to decide which ones align with where you want your product to head. Otherwise, you'll add a 1,000 uh, uh, features to your product without any uh, sort of general direction. The third thing that I think we consider the least when we build a roadmap is the business model in which your company operates in. So I've probably interviewed dozens of product managers over the last year, probably maybe 50-odd, and I love asking questions similar to this. I say to them, you have two features, feature A and, and feature B. And it doesn't really matter what the features are, uh, but the idea is that feature A is wanted by lots and lots of small customers, and feature B is wanted by, by jumping slides, um, and feature B is wanted by one really high-profile customer. I'll just get that back up, sorry. Um, yeah, feature B is wanted by a really high-profile high customer. 
and you can only choose one of these features to implement. How do you decide, how do you decide what feature to implement? How do you decide what feature to implement? I don't know what's going through your mind right now. Um, by the way, no matter how many times you tell the product managers you can only choose one feature to implement, the answer they give you is like they've shipped both. They'll talk for about 10 minutes and somehow they've ended up shipping both. And you're like, no, 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 you can only do one. Which one do you do? Um, but one thing that rarely comes up here is what business model are we operating in? That should influence how I decide to build a roadmap. Uh, if you're in a, a high cost, low volume business, well, then you're probably leaning towards feature B. If you're in a low cost, high volume business, then you're probably leaning much more towards feature A. And there's dozens of other ways you could go about reaching this decision. That's one of the things you need to be careful about, especially when you have new people joining your team, where they'll often respond to maybe the most immediate or the quickest feedback they'll hear from customers and say, yep, that needs to go uh, on the roadmap next. And the third thing and the most obvious thing is a, is a bunch of customer feedback channels uh, as your input. Um, at Atlassian, we have this uh, for a lot of our, our new starters. They get the ultimate guide of where we get all our customer feedback from. And it's effectively a list of all the channels that we have that we get customer feedback on. And this list has a whole bunch of uh, properties. Uh, we say, uh, wh what's this channel? Where is it from? Um, is it qualitative or is it quantitative? What's this channel useful for? Um, well, we hear these types of feature requests from uh, from our support tracker, or we hear these types of feature requests from our feature request tracker. Um, what to watch out for? Hey, on our public feature request tracker, actually, the people that contribute there the most are our admins, they're not our end users. Just be aware of that when, you, when you're getting customer feedback. Uh, how much time will it cost uh, of you to, to go query that source that, uh, for customer feedback? How much weight should you be putting into that uh, source? And this, this guide really helps form a, a broad understanding of, of where to get all your custom inputs so you can form this balanced view before you start to go uh, tackling your roadmap. And really you want to be thinking about a lot of these inputs and a whole bunch of other inputs. Um, a way to test yourself is you have someone new starting in your team. What do you give them before you tell them, ah, go, go work on the roadmap? What do, what do you actually give them to help them do that? Um, you kind of want to give them a set of guides or, or find some way to onboard them quickly so that they're aware of all the sources and they can go and do research with their teams and do the discovery process uh, accordingly, and then they can go ahead uh, and, uh, and form their roadmaps. So that's, uh, that's roadmap inputs. I now want to spend a little bit of time talking about three different ways in which you might want to uh, prioritize or lead prioritization uh, of your roadmap. And you may want to mix and match uh, some of these. The first one is really a goal-driven approach to road mapping. You're probably going, hang on a second, Sharif, doesn't, doesn't all, don't all road maps have goals? It seems like a really silly thing to say. Just bear with me for a second. Um, there are three types of goals I think you can give teams. You can give teams a solution, a metric, or a problem. And you can tell them, go do those things. Uh, I love to give teams the solution. It's really the best thing you can do. Um, in fact, I'd go into real high level. Engineers hate detail. Draw the UML diagram, in fact. Are you a user, press a button, and we want to make money. It's really, really high level. I'm kidding, by the way. Just don't ever do that. Um, uh, there's something certainly not to do. Um, I've given a talk about a bunch of anti-patterns, uh, just pretty much from all the mistakes that I've done. Um, of things not to do when, uh, when building a roadmap, uh, and you can watch that at the link there. But be very, really careful if you, you should never really give teams solutions, because it doesn't matter how that feature is going to work or get used or not used, you've committed yourself to shipping that feature, and they have little or zero context on why they're even doing this or how they'll know it's successful. Um, so I want to talk about the two other things left there, uh, metrics and problems. Let's start with metrics. Um, pro hands down, probably the best read I've personally read uh, on metrics as a product manager is the Lean Analytics book. I highly recommend it if you haven't read it. Uh, there's one section in there, I believe it's chapter two or uh, early on in the book that talks about what makes a good metric. What makes a good metric? And it has a few attributes. Uh, the first one, is it understandable? If I have to give you a paragraph of text or a page to understand, uh, to explain what this metric is, then we've, we've, pro we've probably failed. It has to be simple and, and obvious when you look at the metric. The second thing is, is it comparative? Ah, we shipped feature X and we had 1,000 uh, users use it. Is that good? Is that bad? Is 1,000 a good number? We're always getting more users, so how do I know that's even a good number? What can I compare it to? Uh, what's, what's it been historically? Uh, what other adjacent features are there that, that, that I can uh, you know, uh, baseline it off and that kind of stuff? Third thing is it's a ratio and a rate. Um, you kind of want to say, hey, we've increased it at this rate or this ratio. If you look at absolute numbers, they'll always go up and to the right 
generally speaking, if you're going to get more customers, they'll always go up and to the right. But if you're not comparing it to something, you can't work out how much is it accelerating, decelerating, or as a, re as a result uh, of something you did. And the last one, probably the most important one, uh, I believe, is it behavior changing in a meaningful way? And I'll use the example here of, of uh, LinkedIn, and I'm not uh, LinkedIn bashing. Um, I don't know anyone from the LinkedIn team, so this is purely a hypothesis of mine. But who has used the LinkedIn skills feature? You know, they give you like, hey, nominate this person for these skills. Yeah, you've all got that, right? Um, if you look at my skills, I'm probably the best engineer there is in the world, even though I haven't coded for about nine years. Uh, I'm, I am an amazing product manager. I don't, I don't, um, yeah, that does lots of mistakes, ignore that. Um, I'm a scrum master. I've never done a scrum master role in my life. Um, I'm all this stuff that I, it's completely wrong. I'm guessing there's a whole bunch of people sitting behind some data going, ah, oh, we shipped this feature and look at it. Oh, wow, it's awesome. People are using it and nominating people for skills, etc." I wonder for you yourself, how accurate is even uh, your list? Is it actually doing anything meaningful or, or is it not? Um, the other example I use is, uh, do you remember when Google shipped their Google Circles, the social network a few years ago? The first thing you did when you logged into the network was you organized your friends in circles. And it felt great. I'm being so, I'm organizing all my friends in my, my, my sports circle and my family circle and, and I didn't do anything with it. Um, but I'm guessing they had a lot of metrics that they were watching. They were like, wow, this is really taken off. People are organizing people in circles, but we're not, we're not doing uh, anything meaningful. Um, so two things I want to share with you with giving teams metrics, two things to be aware of, and this is purely from challenges we've had at Atlassian and, and the mistakes that we've made. The first one uh, is, is what I call the trial and error approach to building software. My son has one of these uh, toys or something very similar, and he picks it up, uh, he's a three-year-old son, um, and you know, it's got a, a triangle or a triangular hole, and he picks up a circle and he tries to jam it in the triangle and it, it, it doesn't fit. What does he do? Looks at the next hole and tries to jam the next thing in, or picks up a square and keeps doing it, and then he eventually gets the triangle and it, it fits through the hole. And he does that again and again and again. And I'm sitting with him trying to explain, well, look at the corners, and he's three years old, so we'll, we'll get there eventually. Um, but this is a trial and error approach to doing things. One challenge that we've had, uh, and I've spoken to lots of teams that have this challenge, is the moment they get take a metrics-driven approach, their software, I guess, discovery process, if you like, effectively becomes a trial and error approach. Regardless of how much customer research they do or fact-finding that may come to the table, they completely ignore it, and it becomes this mentality of, we won't know if we don't try, and we'll try everything. Um, and that may work uh, for some things, but I'm not really sure that's probably the most uh, efficient way to do anything, uh, anything in life. And you hear the phrase, um, uh, fail and fail fast. You guys have heard that phrase? Um, and, then, and then we have this culture that's kind of evolving where we're like, where we celebrate failing and failing fast. Don't get me wrong, if we fail on an experiment or something, we want to fail as quickly as possible, so we've, we've eliminated that waste. But I think we're shifting to this, to this thing in our industry where we're celebrating failure so much that you're like, we're encouraging this trial and error approach and we've completely forgot to stop back and, and do some research and talk to people uh, rather than taking this, this trial and error uh, mentality. So the second challenge I want to talk to you about is the lack of countermetrics. So if you're going to give the team a metric, you need to think about what countermetrics, what guardrails are we going to put up to make sure we're just not shifting numbers around and actually doing something meaningful. So I want to give you a practical example here. Um, anyone here use Confluence? Um, most of you, Confluence is a content collaboration tool for teams. They create pages and they work together. This is not a plug for the product, by the way. I really don't care what, what tools uh, that, that you use. I'm actually trying to show you real examples of how we've been trying to implement some of this theory ourselves and the challenges we're going through. Um, but in the tool, you can, you can create a whole bunch of stuff. So you hit, the cre you hit this Create button and you get this dialog that you see uh, there and it shows you all the kinds of things that you can create. Right? One of uh, the, t the goals uh, this team had was to improve the metric on the average number of pages created per user. Um, so what did they do? They decided to split the button. So you, had, you hit create and you went straight to creating this blank content, these what we call blank pages. And then we put all these other templates in this dot, dot, dot sort of button. Dot, dot, dot button. That's what it's called. I don't know what the formal term is. Um, but when you click that, you've got that dialogue with all the templates and all the other fancy stuff uh, that you can create. Uh, and we shipped that. What happened? We were pretty excited. The average number of pages per user skyrocketed. Um, we were like, wow, this, this, was, this is really good. We can move on to the next thing. Moved on to the next thing. Completely left that. 
A few months later, uh, to doing some qualitative research and, uh, with customers and talking about, them, uh, about a whole bunch of things, you'd hear questions like, do you have this th feature X? Do you have th this thing? I'm like, oh, yeah, it is. Just press the dot, dot, dot thing. The what? The, um, up the top there, there's a dot, dot, dot thing. Click that, and you, you'll get what you're after. Oh, OK, cool. Um, oh, oh, that's interesting. Um, then we had a whole bunch of feature requests around, oh, I cr created this thing, but I really meant it, I created a blank page, but I really meant to create this other thing. Can you build me something to convert this to that? I'm like, why are these feature requests coming up? Um, and then we went back and looked at some of the metrics. Um, we had a usage of templates started going down, obviously, because we, we buried them under the dot, dot, dot menu. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? It's a really good discussion to have uh, as a team. Um, but then we looked into more metrics and we realized a lot of the editor features that we'd built had been dropping significantly, uh, cr crazily actually, in fact. And the way you discover some of these features is through the templates uh, that are shipped out of the box. So have we succeeded? I don't know. We had a really good discussion around this. We had a lot of tension around debating about what actually we were trying to achieve and, and at what cost. Um, Alistair, who heads up our software teams uh, at Atlassian, I love his quote. He always talks about being data informed and not data driven. Being data informed and not data driven. And finding that balance between the qual and the quant and empathy for our customers uh, before we jump in too, too deep onto this metrics driven approach. So let's come back to this uh, metrics driven approach. What we probably um, could have done is thought about giving the team a problem rather than giving the team a metric. So if we gave the team a problem, um, we get a whole bunch of different outcomes. Uh, Julie Zhou from, from Facebook talks about the importance of giving team problems and the level of engagement they've seen when you give a team a problem rather than giving them a solution or even uh, a metric to go hunt down. So let's come back to our uh, little create button here. What, what problem are we trying to solve? Well, what we're trying to solve basically reduce the friction for creating content. But there's a little asterisk there, right? we have to qualify the problems for who. It was really for people that already knew what they were doing. The problem is we implemented that for every single user. When we come back and think about this problem, then there's probably a whole bunch of different ways that we can go about solving this problem. We can do shortcuts, we can adapt the design, we can suggest content based on what you frequently create, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of different things we can experiment with and work out what's the best way to solve that problem. And then let the team look at what metrics are the most appropriate uh, for them to measure their own success. The other advantage uh, I've seen about um, communicating problems in roadmaps rather than, than features or even metrics is that it does give you some sort of agility to move uh, with your roadmap. We always often get asked, is there such a thing as an agile roadmap? If I'm putting, doing Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, how is that agile? Like, what, does that, what does that even mean? Um, if you focus on problems, it gives you a bit of agility to move around, right? Instead of saying, uh, um, let's say you're, you're working on a product and your product sends notifications, uh, and your customer tells you, I want batch notifications. That's a solution. If you put that on your roadmap, you've given a team a solution to go and implement. Go and implement batch notifications. Or you can work out what's the problem. Do some research. You find out there's too much noise from the product. They just want to find the signal from the noise. OK, well, let's give them that problem. Reduce, improve the signal to noise ratio, right? What you might want to even do to give you a bit more leeway is group your problem into a theme if you can, right? And this is not always possible depending on your stakeholders, but uh, quite often it is for a lot of internal projects. Um, you may want to group your problems into themes. So instead of saying we want to improve the signal to null ratio, you might just want to say, hey team, we've done some research and our biggest pain point in the product is notifications. Go and improve notifications. Tell us which problems we need to solve and what metrics you'll come up with uh, to go and solve those problems. And the other thing uh, we do, uh, and I've heard a few people talk about this similar as well, is we, we try as much as possible our roadmap for our roadmaps to be now, next, and someday. And our someday is a list of all the things we could do, we've talked about, and we're parking. It's not in a backlog. It's not a thousand issues in your, in your backlogs. No, no, it's probably just dumped somewhere on a page that you can reference every now and then. Um, and your now and your next is like the next period of time, whether your team works in, in four week, uh, sort of periods um, or, 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 f or four months, that's pretty long, uh, but a few weeks, that kind of thing. Um, and your next is like what, what people are going ahead and starting to plan and do research and starting to do discovery for. Um, that's kind of how we, we think about things. So you can get some agility from your roadmaps if you're communicating problems uh, over features. Um, so yeah, I've talked about a lot of stuff there, building uh, roadmaps around problems, being data informed and not being data driven, uh, and thinking about grouping uh, not writing features on your roadmap, 
but grouping them uh, into, pr into problems. And if you can even give your teams more leeway, give them a theme uh, to think about um, in which they, they, they can then choose which problems they need to solve in that theme or the highest impact problems. So that's a goal-driven approach in how you might prioritize uh, your, your, uh, your um, your backlog or your roadmap, sorry. And that works really well for things like if you're trying to optimize a funnel, you may want to give look at metrics, or if you may want to improve customer satisfaction for a particular uh, product problem, uh, you, can, you can kind of take that approach. And the second approach I want to talk about is a persona-driven approach uh, to road mapping. Who here remembers this Simpsons episode? This is a childhood uh, favorite memory of mine. Uh, Homer designs a car. And the car is like this ridiculous car, like he has a dome where he puts the kids in the back so he doesn't have to hear them scream. He has like a gazillion cup holders um, and like lots of horns because he can just slam all the horns at once. Homer designs a car for people like himself, right? And I don't know if you remember the episode, what happens? He ships the car and oh, the audience, you hear this big gasp and everyone's looking around and you can kind of hear the thing spinning around, the squeak. <laughs> It's red, you know, I remember, watched that episode a lot. Um, the truth is, Homer designed, by the way, someone's actually built this car. Um, you can look it up online, it's pretty crazy. Um, Homer designed a car for people like himself. He designed it, if you like, for his persona. And a persona is really just an archetype of your users, which are formed together by a set of research. Actually, there was a good talk yesterday on, um, uh, on how, uh, how a team implemented uh, their personas. Um, and at Alassian, we're pretty big on personas. We have these persona cards as part of our discovery process in a lot of our meeting rooms. Uh, these are the types of the personas we have. Um, um, and on the back of the cards is a set of accountability questions, if you like, to kind of get us thinking about how that person thinks and how that person feels and what that person is trying to do uh, with our team. Um, if you're interested in this, I can send you a whole bunch of stuff. They're actually all online. You can download a PDF with a whole bunch of samples if you're looking at implementing personas yourself. Um, but there's been a lot written about uh, using personas um, for, uh, I guess, feature discovery or uh, to learn more about your customers. Um, by the way, we stick them everywhere, so everyone, it's in everyone's minds. So this totally works. Kind of creepy, but, but, but totally works in our uh, San Francisco office. Um, but uh, you may want to think about building a roadmap around a specific persona. And this is really handy when you want to do things like maybe the, the champion of your product and you want to improve satisfaction with that product. Or maybe you know that specific persona is probably one of the worst attractors uh, of your product and you want to focus uh, on them. So this is an example of uh, com the Confluence team. They have a software team's opportunity backlog um, and they have two personas they're targeting, Alana and Will. And they have the problems they kind of want to solve at a high level uh, for Alana and Will. Um, so they're kind of thinking about their, their roadmap around a specific persona and solving some problems around that persona. So that's one approach uh, you may want to take. Another approach you may want to take is having a roadmap around a persona's role. Now, it's important to decouple personas from the role uh, at which they do, right? You can have a persona called Alana and she can be a, she can be a system administrator or she can be a, uh, a QA person. Um, you need to decouple those two things because they're, they're very different on, on how, how you'll do your research and how you'll design your solution. And so one of our products that we have is called Confluence Questions. Anyone use Confluence Questions? Just how much to explain it. Okay, pretty simple. It's a, it's a, it's a plugin for Confluence, and you, basically you can go in and ask a question, and people can go in and, and answer it for your team or for your project or for your company. That's Q&A sort of thing. Um, and their roadmap is by role. And we have three roles. We have the asker, the person that kind of is seeking the answer, looking for help. We have the expert, which is usually someone in your team or company that knows all the answers. And we have a manager, the person that's kind of over-responsible for the overall sharing of knowledge in the company. Um, and we, draw the, we, we have like the, the classic flow that the asker kind of goes through. They go through this doubting phase, they go through this seeking phase, then they ask, then there's a waiting period, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is their flow in which this role kind of uh, walks through. And then we think about what opportunities do we have to solve problems for that particular role. Um, and so you may want to think about taking a role-based approach uh, to your roadmap. Uh, and this is good for things like social applications where when someone does something and someone else needs to come in and do something else after that person's finished that thing, viral applications, social networking sort of apps, um, thinking about a roadmap by, by role actually works really well um, for that kind of stuff. So I love personas. Personas are awesome. You're going to go on a persona overdose in a second. Um, there's one other way we've been thinking about personas uh, for run mapping, and that's personifying features. And this is really thinking about 
features in abstractions. And we've only tried this in the last probably year and a half, and it's been working really well for us. Um, uh, and I want to give you an example of how this is done. So most of you here said you use Confluence. We have this feature request that customers have been asking for for a while. It sounds a bit embarrassing that we don't have this, thanks to uh, our friends at Google that make rich text editing on the web look like uh, table stakes for everyone. Um, but the ability to resize table columns. You could not resize table columns uh, in our editor. Highly voted feature request from our customers. Sounds pretty simple. So when you resize a table column, should we do it in fixed width or should we do it in percentages? Of course, we should do it in percentages because people have super large monitors, right? You don't, you don't want to make it look like the table's over there, but the monitor is this big. OK, yeah, that sounds good. Oh, but what about all the tables that have like lots of numbers in them, kind of like you know, mini spreadsheets in the product that like, if we do percentages, then you're not even going to be able to follow the math down because it's going to be this full width table, but you, kinda, you just want to line up the numbers together. That's not going to work. Oh, well, we should do fixed width then. Oh, well, hang on a s well, maybe we should make it a setting. Oh, yeah, that'll work. Um, and these are the challenges you kind of have when you're thinking about how to implement a feature like this. And so we've been thinking about how do we personify tables to help us make better decisions and ultimately build a better product uh, as a team. And so what we did was a lot of qualitative and quantitative research to work out what types of table personas exist in our product. We have, we called it, we're really good with names, the basic, uh, the basic table persona. And this is a table where you compare a bunch of stuff together, mostly text driven. We have the accountant persona table. And this is a table which is full of numbers, and they want the numbers to line up. It's very important for them. And um, for them, precision is, is really important. And they usually have a, a summary or a totals row at the bottom. Okay. Then we have the, the, the cheap layout or the poor man's layout, which I'm kind of using tables for something I shouldn't be using. Um, but they have very different needs for how they want to resize tables. Uh, and then you also have the design wall layout, a designer that goes in and says, here's the design, here's a description, here's a design, here's a description. When I resize the columns, should those images bleed or should we resize the images? Ah, oh, okay, well, let's, let's have a discussion about that. So once we start to create table personas, we can start to quantify um, how, how our customers are using our, our feature and then actually make decisions for which ones are we optimizing for. So we've seen huge benefits from personifying features. First of all, better decisions. You're much clearer now as to what you're optimizing for and what you're not. Second thing is it helps build a shared vocabulary in your team. So when we talk, I can say, in the accounting use case, blah, 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 this is not going to work or this is going to be a worse experience. Now we have a shared vocabulary along our team about, about uh, this particular persona uh, of a feature. We can start to refine success metrics. And you may want to define success by the particular type of table persona in this example. Or in our case, what's the success metric of resizing table columns? Do we, is it good if people resize table columns? In fact, it's probably a bad thing if people resize table columns. Maybe we've just got our defaults wrong. Maybe we kind of need to go back and look at that. And it starts to bring up that kind of conversation uh, with your team. The fourth thing it helps you do as a team is align and anticipate the kinds of feedback that you'll get. We know if we optimize for percentages, Mr. and Mrs. Accountant over here are not going to be happy with their tables. That's fine. Software is all about trade-offs. The trade-off we're making is we're optimizing for these types of tables and not these types of tables. And so you start to build this anticipation of feedback that your team's aware of, so when they get a bit of feedback, they don't run around screaming, oh, we got the design wrong, we have to change everything. No, no, we kind of expected that, that we're not optimizing for that use case, we're optimizing for this use case. Yeah, so a bit of persona overdose here for road mapping. But think about building a roadmap around a specific persona. Really good if you want to, you know, you have a champion of your product or some a particular type of persona that gives you a poor rating uh, in, in your product or whatever. Or you might want to think about a role-based uh, roadmap uh, for uh, uh, for how you do your roadmaps, which is really good for social type of applications where you need to close loops and make sure people go through their flows before the next person does their flow and the next person uh, does their flow. And something we've been trying a lot this year that we absolutely love is, is personifying features. And we do this for a lot of things. We personify tables, we personify spaces, for those of you that are familiar with Confluence. So we personify a lot of things here to help us make better decisions as a team and understand the trade-offs that we're making uh, as we're building our software. So the last type of uh, kind of road mapping technique uh, you, you might want to use to help you lead your prioritization is vision-driven road mapping. Uh, and I find this particularly helpful when you're launching a new product or maybe you're starting a, a new big epic in your product um, and you kind of want to paint a, a picture of, of what it might be. So this, this technique's helped more here. 
Um, I don't know if it's good etiquette or not to quote yourself at a conference, but you did. Um, but, but honestly, how often do you evaluate a product more than once? Think about it, you download an app, you try it, you've, you've pretty much decided within a few seconds and you delete it or whatever. And so if, if you only evaluate a product once, how should you then change your roadmap as a result of knowing this information, especially if you're launching a new product? Would you build your roadmap vastly different? And I think you probably should. Uh, at Atlassian, part of the vocabulary everyone uses is the idea of tent pegs. And when you lay out a tent, what do you do? Well, you put the tent pegs out first, right? You kind of go broad, you put these tent pegs out, then you're gonna put the sides up, and then you kind of put all the details on later and, and all the other fancy stuff. But what does it do when you lay out the tent pegs and you go broad first? Well, you kind of, you kind of have a, an idea of what shape the tent is gonna take, right? You have an idea of like, okay, this is how this thing is gonna turn out. You also have cleared out an area there, so people are aware, like, this is the kind of space uh, that you're working in. And then you can kind of start putting the sides up and, and you know, filling in the details later. But the idea here is that you go broad before you go too deep on any one of those sides or in any one of those uh, areas of your products. So what is a tent peg uh, of your product? Um, someone, uh, Shane briefly mentioned this yesterday, he talked about the vision box. Uh, we call it the builder box exercise. I think it's uh, from Thinker Games, Thinker Games guys. But there's, a, uh, there's a link there on how to learn more about how to do this in a, another talk I've given. But the idea here is pretty simple. I was actually talking to a gentleman, um, John, I think yesterday's name was, and he was talking about how, you know, he, we used to ship software in boxes and you'd go buy it in the shop. And it was really important to work out what was on that box. And you made your decision about that product based on what's on that box. This is a serial box. It has a headline. It has a hero shot. You pretty much, the wheat mix is the hero shot. It has its benefits uh, down one side. If I'm walking down the aisle in a supermarket, I'll pick it up and I'll flip it over if I really want more detail before I make a decision if I'm going to buy it or not. We don't have physical boxes anymore when we ship software. And so how do we think about this when we, when we kind of ship a new product or something? How should this influence how we, we build our roadmaps? So the Builder Box exercise helps us do this. This is an exercise we did with one of my teams a few months ago where we literally got a cardboard box, lots of paper, and we kind of said, what's the hero shot of what we're trying to do? What's the one-line pitch? Uh, of what we're trying to achieve, and what are the tent pegs? What are the things that people look at, whether they be problem um, uh, benefits or feature statements at the bottom there, that people look at and go, aha, right, that, that's, uh, that's a tent peg, and that's a tent peg. Yep, I wanted to do this, this, and that. Those are the three things uh, it does. This is what I mean about going broad. You kind of want to identify what those tent pegs are and lay them out uh, as quick as you can. So I'll give you an example here, again, of how we do it at Alessian. We launched a new add-on uh, for Confluence about four years ago uh, called Team Calendars. Um, Team Calendars had three tent pegs. The first one uh, was about people. We wanted you to help you plan the people uh, of your team, work out their availability. Are they traveling at a conference? Are they on leave? Uh, that kind of stuff. But then we also wanted you to understand how your people could impact your projects. So for those of you that use Jira, for example, we had some Jira integration so you can work out, oh, this person is going on leave this week, but we're shipping release number five tomorrow afternoon. Oh, we need to have a conversation. And the last thing we wanted to do was help you communicate your events. These are the types of things that are happening in our team, whether it be training or social events. If you like, these are our tent pegs. I remember even being in a whiteboard drawing these tent pegs uh, with a team that, that worked on this. Now, what we did here is we went broad in our first version. We spent a little bit of time of our roadmap on the people's tent peg, if you like. We put a little bit of effort in our projects template and a little bit of effort in our events template. When I say little, I mean, it's still quality, but you, you don't want to go too deep on that. So when someone evaluates the product, they go, oh, it's not just about this. I can see that it's about these things, and they kind of have a feel of where your product is headed. Now, I want to challenge you here a bit more, and we kind of took a bit of an extreme approach with this. It was a bit of an experiment. And we said, well, why don't we go you know, with our 10 pegs almost at the cost of what may, some may consider table stakes features. Because when you buy a product, you don't really buy it for its table stakes features. You buy it because of its uniqueness. It's 10 pegs, right? Um, and so the first version of Team Calendars we shipped, believe it or not, kind of scares me saying this to you, had zero permissions. So that means you could delete a whole calendar and you lost all your data. Kind of scary. Now, a bit of context here. Uh, four years ago, uh, we didn't have our cloud offering. We only shipped to customers that downloaded it and installed it behind their firewall. And we knew the sales cycles were about 30 days, the average sales cycle, for someone to evaluate the product and try it. And so when people would evaluate the product, we had a few people going, this doesn't have permissions yet, but I, I assume it's coming, right? Yep, yep, it's coming in the next release. 
um, and that's what we're working on next. But we kind of used that time that we would have spent on that, which we have to implement permissions. It was inevitable. We need to do that as soon as possible. But that was an expectation. It was a table stake. You would not buy the product because of that. And we spent that time investing in the other 10 pegs there. 1.1, two weeks later, it came out, uh, and it had uh, the permission stuff uh, there as well. So you may want to think about laying 10 pegs where applicable. I don't know if permissions was the right thing or not yet still in my mind. Um, but you may want to lay them out at the cost of table stakes features, because that's not why people try your product um, there. Um, yeah, so vision-driven road mapping, thinking about your 10 pegs. Um, you may want to use the builder box exercise. There's a link there um, that I uh, had earlier um, that has about how you can do the builder box exercise with your team. Um, and you may want to think about um, how much table stakes can you afford not to have in your initial release of whatever it is uh, that you're working on. Uh, so there's three types of techniques. We talked about goal-driven, persona-driven, and vision-driven road mapping. Th hopefully three different ways to think about uh, building your road map. So what do we cover today? Uh, road mapping is really, um, is really a set of decisions when you think about it. Your road map is a set of decisions. And to make a good decision, you need to, need to nail and know your inputs. Um, and we talked about a few inputs here, and these are just some uh, that I'm aware of, but you know, goals and vision and business model and your customer feedback channels. And if someone joins your team tomorrow and you can't tell them about all these inputs, they're going to struggle to make good decisions on what goes on your roadmap. Road mapping. Now, hopefully, I've given you three different techniques here. Um, Goal-driven, vision-driven, and um, persona-driven road mapping. Um, you know, goal-driven, really good when you want to optimize a funnel, uh, improve, a, improve a feature, or increase the uh, usage of a particular feature. Um, Persona-driven roadmap when you want to focus on satisfaction, maybe focus on the champions, or you're building social software, think about that approach. Or vision-driven road mapping, you're launching a new epic uh, or a new product. How do you tell the world what, what kinds of things uh, you plan to do? Because uh, don't forget, people, you only evaluate a product once. So that's it for me. Thank you a lot for your time. <laughs>